Sorry about that. I don't know why that annoys me so much, but I guess it's your warning that it's being recorded. So we have this data from the internet that 11% have never left, not moved, but never even left their home state. And as I said, these, this is data that you might question. I mean, that's kind of the idea behind a hypothesis test is you're questioning the truth of something. Remember, it doesn't mean whoever came up with that is wrong. It, it could mean that time has passed and now it's not the same as it was before. And so we decide we're gonna question this. And sort of here are the, the main things that we gotta have a sense of in order to do that. And one of those, would be this alpha term in the wrong section. So one of the things we're gonna to need to be told is this alpha that we've been talking about, which is what we have been calling the significance level. Significance level. And I'd kind of like to add to that sort of the, this is kind of like the chance that you're wrong. And so we'll say we're good with, a, I don't know, a 6% chance that we're wrong. So that's something that has to be given. As far as, as far as a homework question, that's something that would have to be in your homework assignment. They would say, they would say let's go check and see if they're right at a 6% significance level. And basically what that means is you're accepting that there's a 6% chance you're wrong. Remember when we did a confidence interval, we said, let's do a 94% confidence interval. And basically that meant we're 94% sure that the actual population proportion is inside this range right here. It included that error. And so if we say we want to be 94% confident, then, uh, then that matches what we wrote here, which is, oh, you mean there's a 6% chance that it could be wrong? Yeah, exactly right. This is, it hasn't changed at all. It's the same exact concept. So, okay, cool. Now, secondly, is kind of this idea of a, of a tail that we talked about last week. In other words, do you think that's too high? Do you think that's too low? Or are you just kind of questioning it saying, well, it's been you know 10 years since that study was done and let's go do it again. I'm not really sure. Um, let's start off with, let's start off with a guess. In other words, you think it's high. So you think that's too high. You can't believe, you know, one in 10 people have never left the state. You're going to go do your own study and you're willing to take kind of a 6% chance that you're actually wrong. And so you go do your own study. So in a sense, that's kind of What's next? Your study. And so, I'm gonna come up with something here that's, So your study, you ask 352 people. Does that feel like a pretty large number? Like, yeah, that's, that's gonna take me some time. And you discover that 24 have never left. Again, with respect to your final project, can you imagine yourself doing this? this could be the kind of thing that was your final project. That's how you get a percentage. Do you also agree that a percent is the only way to even discuss this question? You can't say nine, 19 people have never left the state. That doesn't mean anything unless you say 19 out of a certain number. You can't say 24 people have never left without also saying 352. So the data here is kind of automatically a proportion. So as you know, that would mean, I'll change colors again, 
that your p hat would be x over n you found that 24 people out of 352 had never left and because that by itself isn't something i can really think about i mean it's a fraction and i don't really know what to do with it but if you divide that you get 0 0.068 Does it make sense that your reaction is, aha, I was right. Does it make sense that should be your reaction to that? See, I thought it was low, went and did it, and it was low, I was right. However, when you did your study from this last section, is this actually True. In other words, the p value, is that actually the right answer? Is it actually 6.8%? Is that the true answer to the percent of people that have never left the state? And you should say, absolutely not. We've been studying for a number of sections because if you went and did the same study again, you're not going to get 0 0.068. Remember, there's a normal distribution of all the different answers that you might get there. And so that isn't the right answer. So does it make sense? You might have just checked with a, a low number of people. Um, just out of curiosity, if this number went up to, I won't write this down, but if this number 24 went up to 38, 38 people, in other words, 14 more people out of 352 had said they'd never left the state, that would have been about 11%. So you can't basically conclude, aha, I was right, given that you know that the sample mean isn't the right answer and the distribution of sample means is kind of normal and you might have just been one of those kind of unlucky low people and so a hypothesis test is surrounding the fact that you you got to be right here in other words we're talking about things that are really important not this one this is not an, <clears throat> an important question i don't think anybody would ever do a hypothesis test with this question but what if you're trying to do like a paternity test on somebody it's like you got to be right but that's or maybe it's something pertaining to, as I mentioned the other day, some kind of evidence in a crime. And you have some evidence, biological evidence, that they were at the crime scene, but it's not something as defining as a fingerprint. And so, yeah, their biological makeup matches what was found there, but then so do 10% of people in the population. So, you know, and maybe they're going to the death chair. It's like you gotta be more, you gotta be more right here. It's it's important to know that you're actually right. So I, I hope you understand, I guess, that you really can't say this. Sort of like, not yet, not so fast. Now, notice we didn't just get a little below 11. Can you make, does it make sense to you if we'd gotten 10%? You might kind of, yeah, oh yeah, I got something less, but you do realize there's variation. But notice we went way below that. Like we went clear down to 7% roughly. So again, part of me kind of says, yeah, but, that still is right. <clears throat> so what is a hypothesis test? So fortunately for you, and I mentioned this a little bit the other day, but now we can kind of get serious about this. I'm only going to teach you and put in your assignment what your book anyway calls, and I encouraged you to read this over the weekend, so I hope you already know this, the classical approach. which this won't mean anything to you right now, but it will in a second. You're really comparing Z scores. Now, here's the deal. I'm pulling up your note sheet, and this is the last notes you need to look at. Notice there's a note sheet for a test statistic. Again, that's a word I put in red because it's going to be in your assignment, and I'll use it so that you get familiar with it. But this is what we have to do in this section. This is kind of the 10.2 hypothesis test question. And this over here will be the 10.3 hypothesis test. And this is actually, although your first glance at this should be 
you know, great. You know, here's the 50th formula we've learned in this class. And although I hope you at least would say that's not terribly intimidating in the sense that I could do it, but do you recognize that as a z-score? Remember kind of the way we used to write a z-score, it was like the individual number minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. That should be familiar to you. In other words, this is sort of like the right answer. And this is what your, you know, your particular and your test answer was. And then you divide by the standard deviation. Well, isn't that what's going on up here? In other words, you have a, a sample mean that you just got. We got 0 0.068. You actually have kind of the initial. And notice that little O again. That doesn't say, that doesn't say P. It says the initial P. In other words, this is the null hypothesis. Here, the null hypothesis is that it's 11%. We found that on the internet. And then you're saying, no, I think it's something else. And so you see where that little zero is there? This is kind of like the, the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that the proportion is 11%. But then you went and did this, and you got 7%. And then do you recognize that as the formula for the standard deviation for sample means? Again, what that's getting at is I did a sample with 352 people and there will be variation if I do it again. And this number is actually calculating that. So do you see that as all it looks a little ugly? Isn't that just a z-score? Let's see, I think I'll just copy that and bring it on to the other page. So this is all we need for 10.2 really what it comes down to. So comparing z-scores, let's see if we can compare some z-scores. And I, I said this up there just a second ago, but let's, let's kind of just to make it clear so that you can read this in your assignment. First thing we got to do, like if we're going to compare them, we need two of them to compare. The first one is the test statistic. And again, I don't care about this except for your assignment will probably ask you this kind of thing. It's really just the two Z scores. We're going to get two Z scores for this and we're going to compare them. The second one is kind of that critical value. Okay, so what's the critical value look like? In this case, again, this shouldn't be totally unfamiliar to you. Do you agree that when you said, you think this is too high, in other words, you thought the answer was gonna be less, does it make sense in this case, according to your 10.1 assignment, this is left tailed, this is a left tailed test? You said you think it's less. So because you said it, you committed to a side, that means all 6% is down here. And the remaining 94% is up there. <clears throat> what does that mean? Well, that means if you do a study, there's a 6% chance it will land down here and a 94% chance it'll, it'll be there. And so what, you, what is not new to you, this is a little different because in the previous sections, we always split that 6% in half every time. We didn't commit to which side it was on. In this section, we don't do that. But all I need to do is establish what is that location right there. What's the Z score? What's the Z for that location right there? Can you do that on your calculator right now? This is a little bit different context, but you should be able to. What's that z-score right there? You should also be able to tell me just by looking at it, is it gonna be positive or negative? Yeah. 
Notice it's a z-score, so the mean and the standard deviation are zero and one. If you didn't blow it, you got one point, negative 1.55. You shouldn't have been surprised it was negative because it was below the mean, below the middle. And as you know, to find z-scores, that's an inverse normal question. And it's area to the left of that location. Well, hey, look, the area to the left is 0 0.06. And the mean is zero and the center deviation is one. That's where I got that number. Now, the reason your book thinks, oh, we should have a name for that <clears throat> is because that's critical. That's a really important point. It's a really important location. Why is that? Let's think about this a second. Would you agree that if you did a study, it's kind of unlikely that your random study, remember what that, what that curve represents, what that normal distribution represents is all of the different answers you might get for different studies. The p-hats could be anywhere in there. Would you agree that it is unlikely that p hat lands in that critical area over there. There's only a 6% chance it lands that far away, right? Remember the right answer to the question is here, which is actually 11%. The middle of it is the assumed answer of 11%. So if 11% is right and you go to a study, there'd be lots of answers around 11%, maybe some 10, some 12, but it'd be kind of unlikely to land way down there. Does that concept make sense? There's only like a 6% chance of landing that far away from 11%. Let me add that to this. Again, I'm just trying to give you a chance at conceptually understanding this instead of just mechanically understanding it. So if this represents 11%, the question is where our study, we got roughly 7%. The question is, where did it land? If it lands out there, it's kind of unlikely that it would land out there unless we're actually right. In other words, it really is less than 11%. If we land out there, then we're gonna say we have evidence at a 6%, at a what do we call that? I don't remember myself, a significant sig significance level. At a 6% significance level, we have evidence that it's not going to land out there unless it actually isn't 11%. Does that make sense? If, if the answer is 11%, we're probably not going to land that far out. Now, there is a 6% chance that would happen. I don't think I'd want to send somebody to the death chair, the death penalty electric chair with a 6% chance. Go ahead. What does it feel like it should be to you? What do you what do you think this what are you thinking that would be like two point something or I'm not totally sure I understand your I mean remember I'll erase this, but remember from the past we said in the middle, if you had 95%, which would only leave 5% split in the tails, which is 2.5% here and 2.5% there, we said that was 95%. And we said that was a z-score of, well, negative 2 on this side okay. and positive 2 over here. Okay. Well, notice that's a way smaller percent, and so that's a way larger number. We're to the right of that. You agree with that? Yeah. Now, again, compliments to you, because like, you're thinking, you're trying to make sense of this stuff so that it's more than just, you know, push buttons. You're trying to make conceptual sense of it. So good for you. Please ask those questions. So if P really is 11%. Do you agree that it'd be kind of unlikely that you would have a study that would land that far away? There's only a 6% chance it would land that far down. Does that concept make sense? Therefore, if our study 
lands inside that area, then we're going to say, I think we actually have evidence that it really isn't 11% anymore. Now, if it lands in the other side, then it's kind of like, well, hey, you know, studies vary. The answer is 11%. You happen to do a study that was seven. And, you know, since the studies are normally distributed, it's not that weird. I mean, there's kind of a 94% chance to land in the other side. You land in the other side. So even though you did get a smaller answer, there's not enough evidence. So you can't sort of, you know, say, aha, I was right. See, I got something less than 11%. So ultimately, we're going to say is if it lands here, we don't have evidence to, in the language of 10.1, we don't have language to reject the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is the percent is 11%. And if we do a study and it lands over there, then we have to say, well, you know, studies vary. And so we don't have evidence. We don't have enough evidence, even though we got an answer that was felt strongly less. If we land over here, then we're saying we do. We do have evidence. to reject it's unlikely to land out there if it's actually unless something's really going on unless 11 percent really isn't the answer so now interestingly if we do land out there and notice we don't know yet we don't know where we landed i just kind of set the ground rules if we do land out there, that doesn't mean the new answer is 6.8%. You understand that? It just means it's not 11 anymore and it is, there's evidence that it's less. That's in a sense all we can say. Because remember, we just did one study. Now, what about this test statistic? Well, that's gonna tell us where to land. I said, we're comparing Z-scores. We have one of the Z-scores now that defined that line. And so one side reject, one side we can't reject. So what Z-score do we get for the test statistic? Well, let's go plug all that stuff in up here and see what we come up with. So we got our P hat of 0 0.068. Notice you got to know the language. You got to know what P hat is. That's the study that you just did. And we're subtracting it from the established, we're subtracting from it the established value for P, which was 11%. I'm just curious, did I say in the note sheet what? what that little P zero meant. Did I say what that was down here? Yeah. Notice I said that's the proportion stated in the null hypothesis. So that little O. So that's kind of the established. Exactly. So that's the Z score, the critical value. And notice that's a little, that's a little Greek letter alpha. Oh, what's the Z O on the Oh, this right here. Yes. Yeah, that's again kind of the established Z. In other words, that's the initial Z value. The Z value based on 11% basically being the sort of the right answer to this question. So again, as far as, as far as my test is concerned, I definitely don't want you to get this stuff wrong because of all the language, which is why I'm trying to put some of that language on the note sheet. As I've said, I could make you memorize that, but if I see you in the street a month from now, you're not going to remember any of that. I don't remember this even from one term to the next when I teach it. The language is just not something I use every day, even though I teach it. So I don't want you to get this stuff wrong because of language. So that little PO is defined on the other page. And then what am I dividing by? Well, the square root. Notice which P, do you agree I have two P values here? Which P am I using to do this calculation? <clears throat> Yeah, the initial one. Does it make sense why that would be the case? Do you agree that this number is kind of the established fact? You assume that somebody did a really good study. I mean, we found it on the internet, so it's it's the one that you can count on. But then you went and did your own study. Well, you only did one, and of course, maybe you only checked with 12 people. So you're using kind of the best answer. Does that make sense? You're using the one that makes that's the truest at this point. Now, maybe we're about to overturn that. 
but but that's just kind of an important point to make. So okay, fine. P zero we said was 0.11. You now know that Q is what's left over from 100%. So that would be 100% minus 0.11, which of course is 0.89. And then you divide by n. <clears throat> and notice. We don't know the original N, like which N is it? We don't know the N that came from the 11% study up here. We just found on the internet said 11%. So the only N we know is the one that we that we did, the 352. So that N will always come from the study that you just did. And so all of this calculation is going to tell me what side of this red line am I on? If I get a Z score that's further away than negative 1.55, like negative 1.6, negative 1.7, negative 2, negative 2.2, then I'll land in this area. If I get something smaller, negative 1.5, negative 1.4, negative 1, something like that, then I'll then I'll be in a different. So it's it's all about like where <clears throat> where do I land as a result of this? Do you see why what we're comparing these Z scores up here? Well, let's see. Again, you could screw up the order of operations here, but I hope you're uh, practiced enough at this kind of thing that you're not making those mistakes too much anymore. I would very much encourage you to type this in and get the same answer I got and bug me when I'm walking around later. If you don't, I got negative 2.5. I'll call it 2.52. Ah. So it's those two Z scores that we're comparing in the class, which your book calls the classical approach. We're comparing those two Z scores. So of course, we landed out in that kind of critical region. We landed way beyond negative 1.55. Maybe we landed clear over here. So now we actually can say what we initially thought, which was, aha, I was right. <clears throat> it is less. C. Now, why was there evidence? Well, it's because you checked with a lot of people. Just for the heck of it, I'm going to do something here really quick. I think, I think I'll erase this, but just out of curiosity, if this number right here, if this number right here had been 112 people, so way back up here, when you got your 6.8%, if this number had only been 112 people, When you ran this, you would have got negative 1.42 for your z-score. Does it make sense that would have put it on the other side? Like, why why was there actually enough evidence to reject this? Because you checked with a lot of people. That made your number a lot more solid. If we'd have done this with 112, we, we would not have had enough evidence. Your, your number is kind of not strong enough. So do you, in a sense, do you see why this needs to be done? If you get 7%, well, it depends how strong your number is. How many people did you check with? And, and we know studies bounce around a little bit. And so the fact that we checked with so many people is what caused this to, to actually be rejectable, if you will. Let me go back and erase what I wrote here so it doesn't screw up your thinking. We'll do more examples. So then your conclusion, as I already wrote up there in black, There is, and your book kind of freaks out about this a little bit, and 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 maybe if you know, maybe that matters, but not not where we're at. We're just learning this. Technically, you can't say. Technically, you can't say I'm going to accept 
the 6.8 answer, 6.8% is the new answer. And now we throw 11% away as some old number. You can't actually accept that. It's more just there is there is evidence that it's not 11%. And not only that, it's actually lower than that. It's not automatically established at 6.8. Do you see what I mean by that? Um, if you'd only checked with 12 people, does it make sense? Like we should not have that number be the, be the number that all people in the universe think about here. So all you can really say is, given that there's only a 6% chance, if 11% was indeed the correct answer to this question, there's only a 6% chance that you would do a study and land that far out. And then basically you're saying, well, 6% chance, that's not very high. So I don't think that happened by accident. I think there is something going on here. Remember, it does not mean you're correct. 6% is still one out of 16. That means one out of 16 studies would land down there. It's not proof. That's what's so interesting about this is, you know, we'd like to prove if we're in a court of law and we're going to send somebody to jail or something like that, we'd really like to know for sure. We don't want to send somebody to jail that doesn't deserve it. And we don't want to let them off if they do. But it's like you can't prove it. You just have to go with a percent. So this person said, all right, 6% will do it. Does it make sense if I change that critical value from 6% to like 2%? then maybe we would not have had an event. And, and, and as I said, if this was a more important question, then you might choose a, a more limiting number for this. I don't know if that makes sense. So <clears throat> as I said, we're just going to do some more examples of this to try to get this to go a little bit deeper in your head. Okay. Yeah. These are some of these questions. Like, there's not, we don't have to go through the steps of like figuring out a say, like the, the last part where. Are you looking on the note sheet? Like getting, um, sorry, I'm having a hard time. Um, in the last one, when we did like a study, we had to figure out the parameters that it would have been uh, like within. That doesn't have any effect on this. Yeah, reality is. Do that first and then do this. Or do we just like. Yeah, this is all you have to do. Okay, yeah, that's what I was. That's correct. And that's what's kind of annoying is we're actually not doing any different math than we did in the previous section. It's just we're doing it all kind of from a different point of view. If <clears throat> in the last section. If we did our study and we got p hat was 0 0.068, and then we did all that other stuff we did in chapter nine, and let's say we got an error of, <clears throat> let's say 2% in our study, does it make sense? Then you would say, oh, okay, well, I'm now 94% confident. Remember alpha was 6%. So we're 94% confident that P is, well, I could add to and get, so let's make this, Let's make this four. So you have a four percent error. Then that would take this up to ten point eight percent, and all the way down to two point eight percent. So we're basically ninety four percent sure that the real answer lies in there somewhere. But did it, did the answer that did it did it like wasn't p eleven percent? Do you see how it's like it's outside of that range? In a sense, if we were to do this problem in, in that exact same way that we already understand, since P is not in that range at 11%, then that kind of is evidence that, well, something's going on here then. Studies bounce around. This bounced around a lot, 4%. If I go 4% above and below my study, the highest I get is 10.8%. So, you know, it kind of means like, I don't think that's true anymore. Do you see what I'm saying? It'd be the same math. It's kind of like, well. So which one's like more reliable? Which one's the one that will be used for? Like, is it, I remember last week you were saying that like ten point two and stuff is like stuff you wouldn't really be using unless it's based like here on this math, but like the same information. <clears throat> the other, like nine point two, that's the one. Like that's the more reliable data, or they're actually the identical. Data? The only. So they're identical. Yeah, you'd get the same conclusion every time. Oh. So that's, as I said, what kind of bothers me. Well, you're, we're using what I showed you today. Oh, like, okay. Yeah. Just, but, but as a teacher, because I'm interested in conceptual understanding and I want people to actually be able to make sense of things, 
I, I bothers me a ton to sort of teach you the same logic, but now we're just doing it a totally different way. And that's bothers me and it's bothering you. So yeah, I mean this, what you just did right there, that's what you're gonna do in 10.2, that's it. Every, every time you're gonna compare those two Z scores. Notice one Z, just think about what the ingredients were. This Z score down here came entirely from that alpha number, that significance level. It came entirely from that number. We got a Z score from that. And then we got a Z score from our study. And then we just compared where did it land? Let's do it again. Let's see what other interesting pursuit in a percent data do we have? Okay, so this is probably a good one. I don't think I told you this one the other day, but this is another one I looked up. 85% of Americans own a smartphone, not a cell phone, a smartphone. I think that just means it's got the internet, right? Am I right about that? Apps and you can get on the internet. So does it make sense to you that that, because we looked it up on the internet, we know have no evidence to the contrary, does it make sense that represents kind of our initial or null percentage? I, know, I actually don't know if you have to say this in this section, but then it's kind of like, okay, the initial hypothesis is that P is equal to 85%. So again, that's why they put the little zero down there, because it's kind of like it this entire statement right here is now kind of summarized by just saying P0 is 85%. That's the established wisdom. That's the initial, that's the initial thought. That's all we have to go with. And now you're wondering, has that changed? And of course, over the last few years, that number's grown a lot. Probably six years ago, that probably number was probably like 20% or something like that. So again, this isn't somebody being wrong. It's just, it's growing and growing and growing. So Again, if you cared about this for economic reasons or whatever, you might say, I'm, I'm not sure that's true, or I think that's changed. Maybe, and maybe you think it's rising. So last time we said we thought it was 11% was too high. Well, maybe this time we think it's too low. Too low? That's kind of what we're wondering. And so let's say this matters to us more than the last problem. And so we decide we want there to be a 2% chance for error. We only want to be have a 2% chance that we're wrong. That's a tougher measure. Do you agree with that? That's asking a lot more now. We're saying if we're going to send this person to the electric chair, so to speak, we want to be sure. We only want there to be a 2% chance we're wrong. So does it make sense that you could go get right now, just without even kind of reading the next question, without you doing your study, could you kind of find that Z score? Maybe I'll call it Z of alpha. In other words, not Z of alpha over two, but just Z of alpha. Why? Because you said too low, which makes this a right tailed test. You committed. You didn't say, I don't think it's right. I'm not really sure which way. Right tailed. So that means you're thinking that the 2% error is up here. And that means the other 98% is over there. And so just like last time, we need, we need to know what that z-score is right there, because that's what separates likely from unlikely. Very unlikely to be in 2%. Very likely to be in 98%. So again, as you did before, you do inverse normal. But this time you don't get to type two in, right? You got to type area to the left. This time it's 0.98 that you've got to type in. So 
So I'll write that part out, inverse normal, 0 0.9801. You got a z-score of 2.05. Again, you should not be surprised that you got a positive number. You should not be surprised that it's over 2%. I'm sorry, over 2.05, because remember we said a second ago, if it was 0 0.025, then that would have been exactly two, and this is a little smaller than that. So in a sense, no wonder I got such a small number. So I've got that z-score right there, and now let's go do our study. Let's see, and I'd kind of like to try to make this work out a little better this time. So give me a second to kind of make up a make up something that's kind of tight. Let's see, what am I doing wrong here? Not yet, I'm trying to figure this out so it works out a little more interesting. Last time it sort of blew way past it and this time I wanna make it want to make it a little bit better. Okay, I think I got it now. So you do a study and you get, and this time I'm going to say this a little different, I'm just going to tell you p hat right up front, you get 91%. Now remember, you can't just get that from nowhere, you would have to go ask people and so forth. So I'll also tell you that n is 142. So you asked 142 people, and you found out that 91% of them had a smartphone. Again, would you agree that this feels just like last time, which is sound the alarm? I mean, we got a number that's 6% higher than that. Supposedly the answer is 85. It's been a few years since we did the study. We did it again, got 91. Doesn't it feel like, doesn't it feel like, yeah, it's higher, see? Quite a bit higher. It's not like I get 87%. I didn't get 89%, I got 91, that's 6% higher. The question is always, is there evidence? That indeed 0.85 is too low? Is there actual evidence for that? Your gut reaction, as I said, should be, yeah, you just got 91, duh. Also, didn't you ask quite a few people? This isn't like the study you're about to do in this class where you only ask 30 or 50. That's a lot of people. But remember, the question is, where is the z-score that we get gonna land? We have one z-score there, 2.05, in order to In order to say we do have evidence that 0.85 is too low, in other words, evidence to reject this null hypothesis up here, then our z-score has to land in this area if we are to reject the null hypothesis. It has to land out there, which means we need a z-score bigger than 2.05. Doesn't have to be very much bigger, 2.06 would do it. But if we get something less than that, then we don't have evidence. Well, can you produce the z-score for that from this formula right here? <clears throat> so we sort of have our z-alpha. Can you have the z that came from that 
initial score. I'm going to go calculate that now. So our Z0 number is our R study P hat minus the established answer divided by the square root of the established answer times what's left over from 100 all divided by 142. Punch that in. If you don't screw it up, you get 2.0. So hopefully, shockingly, there's not enough evidence. Do you see where it landed? Where did it land? Notice it wasn't by much, but it basically landed right there. It landed in the 98% area. So we don't have evidence. Isn't that kind of weird? Like I did a study and got 91% C is higher. But because studies vary, and you decided you wanted to be really sure, you only wanted there to be a 2% chance you were wrong, then slightly it didn't make it. Can you appreciate if I had said alpha was 3%, I'm okay with a 3% error, then it actually probably would have been okay to reject this? Isn't that kind of weird? So the important conclusion here is, this is not, not in that tail. I think your, I'm sure your book has some name for that. Not in the critical area or something like that. So I did this just based on kind of without extra words thrown in, but just maybe to add those back in. This was our test statistic. Your book will probably ask for that. We just found the test statistic. And this was the critical value. So if they ask you for those specifically, and I can see why they would. In other words, you can't just, it's a 50-50 chance. If I set on a test, should you reject it or not, you could just flip a coin and have a 50% chance of getting it right. I mean, you got to kind of show that. So your, your book will, or your assignment will probably ask you for those two things. Rounded, perhaps. You got to be a little careful about rounding, as you know. And so maybe it's the two decimal places or whatever. I can see, I mean, if I don't like language, but I can see why they did it. In other words, this is the critical number, isn't it? If we're on one side of it, we can reject it. If we're on the other, we can't. So that's kind of the critical number. That's the knife's edge. That's the dividing line that 2% caused. And then we did our test. We went and did our study, if you will. We did, we did our test. We got a statistic. A statistic meaning, remember, that changes. I went and did it with 142 people. I got my test and, oh, it actually landed in the big area. So conclusion is, I don't have enough evidence. We don't have enough evidence to say that P is actually not 85%. At the 2% confidence level, that is, which again is a really tall order. There's not enough evidence to say that. Again, what's what's interesting about this is that does that mean it's does that mean it is still 85%? No, it just means we don't have evidence to turn it over yet. It could actually be higher. Maybe it really is 91%. We're not saying it is. We're not saying this is wrong. We're just saying we don't have enough evidence to say it right now. You got to be sure. So we do more studies when exactly. 
exactly. Um, I don't think you guys will be able to see this at home, but you'll be able to see it in this room here. Um, what are we looking at? Oh, this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and this is why I played with this a little bit before. But see, what if you went? What if you went and redid this, and it was like 189 people? Does it make sense? That's a hair stronger now because you asked more people. Notice the z-score is now 2.31, and now then you would have evidence because it's a stronger number than it was before. You see what I mean? Isn't that kind of weird? That's exactly right. You want to ask a bunch of people. That's kind of what it comes down to, and that that should feel good to you. Like if you ask seven people, then there's going to be a lot of error in that. And so that's just kind of interesting that that's the case. Um, and then back up here a minute ago, remember when I did inverse normal with 0.98? That's where I got the 0.25, the 2.05. But you know, what if I'd have said it was a three percent? What if I said, I'm good with a 3% error? That seems pretty decent, doesn't it? Well, notice you only get a z-score of 1.88 then, which means our 2% would have been out in the tail. So at a 3% level of confidence, then there would have been evidence. And so isn't it kind of weird how just a tiny little decision like that, which again, is kind of funny because in the real world, you might get to pick that yourself. Like I want to reject this. And so I realized 2% didn't work. Oh, I'll just go back and change it to three. And now I can say I do have evidence. Remember what that means is there's only a 2% chance. There's only a 2% chance that you would land out there. So if you do land out there, then that kind of means you have evidence. Well, we didn't quite make it, but we were really close. We were super close, 2.0 and 2.05. So on your final project, if you are doing Something that is something that involves a percent. This is a calculation that you could actually make, which is kind of cool. Do we need to do this on our final project? Um, yeah, one of, one of your goals is to try to get in every calculation we've made. Um, it should feel like in your final project, you're going to get an answer to your question, just like we did here from a study. And what was yours again, Shelly? We talked about it in class, but also I can't remember. I changed my Oh, you did. Um, but if you can find an answer on the internet to your question, of course, it'll be different than what you found. And, and again, probably the internet would be more trustworthy because you're not asking that many people. Um, and you'll get a different answer, but that's kind of a cool calculation to throw in there. In other words, I don't have evidence that my actual answer is better than what's on the internet because I only checked with 32 people. So. Yeah, if you can throw a hypothesis test in there, one of your part of your grade for this, and it shows on that sheet, is kind of maximizing the number of calculations from this class that you could squeeze in there. Just kind of demonstrate that you learned something in here. So let's do this. We, we're going to talk about this more tomorrow. Um, so I'm gonna you know, bring some more examples. You might even start playing with the homework assignment right now. I mean, these two examples, actually, I wanna say one more thing. What if we won't do this now because I do wanna give you a, some kind of random time here, but, but if I did a kind of a third example, I'll just say this much. Let's see, I'm trying to think of a percent related answer that somebody might be interested in. Oh, I don't know. I think I think I said the other day that 16% of people don't know their neighbors' names. They don't know their neighbor. Again, when I see data like this, I kind of find myself saying, eh, that's interesting, but who cares? What if you don't say, as we said before, and I want you to stare back at this really quickly, that this first person said, no, I think that's high. I don't think it's 11%, I think it's high. 
The second one said, no, nah, I don't think that's true. I think it's low. Does it make sense that made it right and left tailed? What if this third person said, you know, I don't think so. But do you see how they haven't committed? They're not saying, I think that's too high. I think that's too low. They're just saying, I don't know, let's redo the study. In a sense, oddly, this is kind of what people do in the real world. In other words, you, you just redo a study, but you're actually not sure ahead of time. You're just saying, I don't know. Kind of like low, high, I don't know. I don't have a strong opinion about that. Does it make sense that this is where you had a two-tailed test? Now, why was that important to note? And we'll, we'll do an example of this and pick it up tomorrow. But basically that means if you were making that calculation for, notice I have to even look at the language myself because I don't remember it, the critical value. If you're gonna get that Z-score right there, does it make sense all of our 2% went in that upper tail because we said we thought it was too high? This person isn't committing. So, this is a two-tailed test. So if somebody said, all right, well, let's do this for an alpha of say, let's quit being so nice. Let's do something that's not gonna come out so easy. 7%, well, because you haven't committed, you can't put all 7% on the left tail or the right tail, you gotta split it up. So that's why it's important from 10.1 to kind of recognize this is a two-tailed test. So then your Z score that comes from that alpha is going to be based on this drawing where you say, oh, leftover from seven is 93%. But just like we did in the previous section, I'm going to put that in the middle and I've got to put half of 7% in the upper tail and half of 7% in the lower tail. And I'll get a Z score from that. And then when you go do your study, it's like you don't even have any idea. Maybe you won't get 16%, probably you won't, but you're not sure, you're gonna get 18%, you're gonna get 14%, you don't even know. So your Z-score will be based on that. So in a sense, I kind of need almost, it's almost like I kind of need both of those Z-scores. And of course they're the same, one's just negative and one's positive. So what hasn't changed is it still has to land in one of these tails still has to land out there in order for us to reject it. But until we do the study, we're not even sure which direction it will go. So in a sense, this is the most intellectually honest one, if you will. Is the two-tailed test. Okay, so all I wanna do is take maybe five more minutes and just have you look at look at the homework assignment and see if you can at least kind of go, oh, okay, at least I see what they're asking now. As I said, we're gonna do some more examples tomorrow. Two more assignments, oh my gosh, that sounds wonderful. Notice there's only five questions, six questions. There's only six questions. However, there's a lot of parts to them. So it's actually still worth quite a few points. But let's just stare at number five randomly. To test the claim that the pro pro proportion of men who own cats is significantly different. Notice it says significantly different. It didn't say more or less. Is 90%. Yeah, yours, yours might be a little different. It should be actually the same wording. Number five, question five. Yeah, so see, that's a variable. Yours said smaller, meaning left tail test. Mine said different. In other words, they don't know. Mine's a two tailed test. Yours is a left tail test. So apparently that word different is a variable from person to person to person. And notice it says at the point one significance level. Notice I got to know the word significance level. Or I don't know what that's talking about. So that's kind of saying alpha is 10%. So again, what's your thought? The percent of men, and probably 90% is a variable too, but it says the proportion of men who own cats is 90%. Do you think 90% of men own cats? 
That's a little high to me. But this person says it's just not 90%. They're not committing. So can you state the null and alternative hypothesis? <clears throat> What's the established fact? What is it you're what is it you're saying based on that sentence up there? That's a 10.1 question. Then you have to say, is that make it right, left, or two-tailed test? And then notice what it's asking for, a test statistic. That's got to mean something to you. And then the critical value. That's the two words that we looked at today. And notice they said positive because there's a positive and a negative. So they said, give us the positive. They said this needs to be rounded to two decimal places. And now by comparing those two z-scores, you either can reject the null hypothesis or you have to fail to reject it. Like that's what we just did today. Now I only did two examples. So if you could, if you can do that right now, good for you. It seems like we need a little more practice. Now notice as it turned out, this person did a sample of 50 people and they found 86%. So sure enough, they didn't get 90. Um, from this though, notice you can't say, oh, it's lower because because they they initially started this whole thing because they disagreed. You don't, you, you actually have to choose your alternate and null hypothesis first and say what tail it is. And then you go do your study. And of course the study is not going to be 90%, but you don't know, is it higher or lower until you actually do the study. So I'm going to shut up. I would advise you to ask me some, um, some final project questions if you have them, because remember, we're going to, you're going to be done with this and even giving a little five, three to five minute presentation next Wednesday, probably. Next Wednesday, our, our last test is on Tuesday. And so you're only, you know, a little more than a week away from that. So if you want to ask me any, how does this looking stuff? Um, is there any stuff I should add? That kind of a thing. You're more than welcome to ask that. Um, I think that'd be the best use of your time, honestly, because I, I, I want you to do well on that and I'm happy to advise you a bit, um, even correct stuff that's wrong and so forth, if I can, if I can do that quickly. Um, but of course, if you either are feeling like you're rolling on that or you just don't feel like you have any questions right now, you're more than welcome to take a stab at this. You do get three tries. Um, to that end, I'm going to I'm going to share my screen again and put up the notes that I just made. So if you do decide to kind of play around with this, you can. I will be around Angela for office hours. I'll be around after class till about probably two. But I think I'll just leave that last example up there. 